Al came in the office right beforehand. He said, are we done to Romans? I said, no, we're going to review the whole thing today. He said, well, that'll put us out of here at one o'clock. I said, come on, Al. Come on, at least 1245. I mean, you know, we're not going to go all the way to one. Paul wrote on his third missionary journey a letter to a church that was established and, and, and was growing and was dynamic. And he had never met many of those that were a part of this church located in the capital city, the Roman capital city of Rome. And these believers, both Jew and Gentile, were growing and trying to figure out how to do life together under the same umbrella of faith in Jesus. And Paul was just so anxious to get there and meet them. He wanted to get there so that he could meet them, have a ministry opportunity with them. He wanted to teach them some things. He knew they could teach him some things. And, and he also had an ulterior motive as well. He said, once I get there and once I've spent a little bit of time with you, now I'm going to hope that you'll help me to go from Rome on west to Spain because the gospel has not reached that far. And I'm hoping that I can get a partnership out of you there that can help us take the gospel even farther. So he's writing this letter to them in hopes, in anticipation, in plans of going to them. And then moving beyond where they are to take the gospel even farther. As we studied the letter of Romans, we learned a lot of different things. And this morning, we're going we're gonna to have 19 reminders. There's 16. In fact, you, if you came in today, you should have gotten one of these handouts. Right? So I know some of y'all like to take notes and whatnot. If you didn't get one of these, Al's got some. If you just raise your hand, we'll keep going. He'll bring you one if you'd like to have one. Just keep your hand up and watch for him. He's the, uh, he's the, uh, the, not quite, he's the elder statesman there in the pink, and he'll, uh, he'll get it to you. We're going to get six, 16 chapter reminders and then some three rejoicing opportunities. We won't hit the things that maybe you go through and you go, how could he have brought out chapter 3 and didn't bring up? Listen, there's no way. Because remember, we're trying to make it 1245, right? Ish. Ish. Thanks, Chad. We can't hit them all. But these, when I started studying the, the, the book of Romans, I, I, I made this book chart that I was taught how to do in seminary, but I never really learned how to do it all that well. But I modified it into a way that made sense to me. And, and what I did this past week is I, 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 didn't, I didn't consult my notes. I went back to that chart. I said, okay, we just need some points and started looking at that chart. And I saw how that in each chapter, I believe that God had laid on my mind a theme. And so this morning, we're going we're gonna to do a 30,000 foot flyover of Romans. And we're going to start with chapter number one. We'll have a point, and then we'll have some scriptures. Miss Lori's going to do her best to keep up with where we are. Reminder number one, the gospel is the power of God for salvation for all who believe. That should, should pop up here any minute now. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. It should be the slide just before that. There we go. Boom. Yellow is the one you're looking for if you've got a sheet with blank. See, I'm trying to take care of you. Romans chapter 1 verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Reminder number two. Mankind, both Jew and Gentile, all stand guilty before God and are without excuse. Romans chapter number 2, verses 1 and 2. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself. Because you, the judge, practice the very same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice 
such things. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. But mankind demonstrates by their very own actions that there is a reason that the gospel is necessary. And that is because even when we think ourselves better than others, maybe more good than bad, what God's Word does is it it reveals to us that no, in fact, you who judge others as maybe a little worse off than you, you're guilty of the very same things. And in your judgment, you demonstrate yourself without excuse But Romans chapter 3 gives us our third reminder. In verses 21 through 26, it tells us that salvation is by faith in Jesus, through whom God is just and the justifier. You see, God has to be just because He is holy. And when mankind is guilty before Him in sin, what can God do other than judge sin? What He can do is provide a means For salvation, Romans 3, 21 through 26. But now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God, that's through faith in Jesus Christ. For all who who believe, for there's no distinction. For all have sinned, you and me, and fall short of the glory of God. And we're justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance, He had passed over former sins, and it was to show His righteousness at this present time so that He might be just, And the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The righteousness of God has been revealed to broken sinful mankind in the person of Jesus Christ. And that righteousness can be ours not by keeping the law, but through faith and faith alone in the work of Jesus. His death, His resurrection in our place and for our sin. And you say, why did this happen? Because God put Him forward as that substitute, as that sacrifice, as that place where justice and love can meet. And in Jesus, God poured out His wrath. But through Jesus, God provided a righteousness that can be ours. You see, there'll be nothing we can ever do about our sinfulness, about our situation, about our, about our guilt before God. But He's done what we can't do for us in the person of Jesus. And when we trust by faith in the work and the person of Jesus, God can then justify us. He can declare us righteous because that guilt has been placed on the substitute. And when we are justified, we can be brought near to Him as one redeemed by the blood of God the Son. So God then maintains His justice and through Christ can also be the justifier of the one who has faith. Reminder number four. Abraham was an Old Testament example, a very important Old Testament example, that salvation or justification, being made right before God, has always been about faith, always been by faith. Romans 4, 3. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. God had promised Abraham and his wife that they would be the parents of a child who would have descendants, and that descendant would become a mighty nation, and that nation would bring about God's blessing for all people. Yet Abraham was far beyond the childbearing, well, actually not Abraham, Sarah was far beyond the childbearing age, and yet Abraham believed God. That God could do what was humanly impossible. And God counted that belief, that faith, as righteousness. Romans 4, 23 and 25. But the words it was counted to him was not written for his sake alone, 
but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification in the same way that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So now we too believe in what God has provided, the finished work of Jesus, and it is counted to us as righteousness. In Romans 5, we get our fifth reminder. The first Adam, we know him from Genesis, through his disobedience brought to all of us sin and death. But Jesus, who's referred to as the second Adam, has provided through his act of obedience salvation and life. Romans 5, 12, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through that sin, so death spread to all men and women because all Sinned. In Adam, yes, we're all guilty because of our connection to the human failure in Adam. But we also demonstrate our sinfulness because we sin ourselves just as soon as we have the opportunity. We're guilty because of Adam. But the free gift, Romans 5 through 15, 5, 15 through 17 says, but the free gift, what is that free gift? That free gift is salvation. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, that's Adam's, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus, abounded for the many. As Adam has led us all into sin through his disobedience, how much greater is it that through the obedience of Christ, putting on flesh, living in the righteousness of God, fulfilling the law's responsibilities or, or the law's requirements, and then Jesus laying down his life for us has provided something far greater than the sin that was thrust upon us. He's provided salvation that can be ours through faith. Verse 16, And the free gift is not like the result of one man's sin, for the judgment following one one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, and it has been, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ. You realize that there's nothing in this world, not science, not technology, not politics. There won't be anything that can change the course of broken humanity. We can build things, we can dress it up, we can make it look nice, but at the end of the day, we're all broken to the core and there's nothing within the realm of humanity that can change that. But God, through His Son, who put on flesh, broke into humanity and provided for us the thing that can alter our brokenness. And it's his death, it's his resurrection, and it's available to all who receive. Those who have received, though, who were once formerly slaves to sin, our sixth reminder Slaves to sin are set free in Christ. And we can live for God now in obedience. That doesn't mean we're not ever going to sin. That doesn't mean we're not ever going to fall. It just means we've been set free from its captivity. Slaves to sin are set free in Christ to live in, God, to live in obedience to God. Romans 6, 5 and 6. For if we have been united with Him, that is Christ... If we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. That's a great promise. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved 
to sin. Prior to salvation, prior to justification, where we by faith trust Jesus, we are shackled to sin. We can do nothing but. But through faith in Jesus, we're set free. We're given a new life. We're given a new opportunity to follow him in obedience, not to earn his love, But because we have received his love, we can now walk in freedom and we can obey him according to what he has given to us. Number seven, our reminder. The law, it's good, did what it's supposed to, shows us our sin. But the law rules, trying to measure up to God's holiness is completely unable to save us. The law can show us our sin, and it continues to do so, but it cannot save us. Romans 7, 7, what shall we, so what then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. If it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. It does a great job of showing us our sin. But verse number 10 of chapter 7, the writer says, But the very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. Why? Because I can never measure up. It shows me what holiness looks like. It shows me that I am far removed from holiness. But as it says, if you are righteous before God, if you are holy, then you can have life. And I know it says what it means, but I can never attain that. So rather than it bringing me hope, all it does is bring me death because it was never designed to save. It was only designed to reveal Christ has come to save. And he will for all who Believe. Those who believe. Chapter 8 gives us our eighth reminder. Those who are in Christ. I love the way Paul uses that. He'll use it in other letters that he writes. We're in Christ. Did you hear earlier? We're united with him in his death. We will be united with him in his resurrection when that time comes. Those who are in Christ experience the new life of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Romans 8, verse number 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you have by faith trusted Jesus as your Savior, you have been united with Him. And even though spatially speaking, it it, it does not physically look like it in a very real spiritual reality we are secure in Christ and if we're in Christ we'll never be condemned why because Christ will never be condemned and if we're in him we're secure in him we have his life Romans 8:11 If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead, who is that? The Holy Spirit. If He dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Do you know Jesus as your Savior today? I hope that you do. If you do, the Holy Spirit of God indwells you. And the wonderful promise for our eternity is that His Spirit is going to provide us with that life with Christ that is eternal. But don't miss the life that is for today. The Holy Spirit will give us guidance into and direction direction throughout this life right now and it can be brand new so many days you and I wake up and we try to navigate life on our own 
We try to roll out of bed, and, and we've got all kinds of things. We've got all kinds of lists and circumstances and stuff that, that we try to figure out on our own, and we end up just spending day after day frustrated and, 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 and aggravated and maybe even falling over into a little bit of despair. Maybe some hopelessness, of course, sneaks in. And the reality of the fact is, is that God the Holy Spirit is present with us. And if we will simply tune our ears to him, he'll communicate that we don't have to do this by ourselves. In fact, he'll lead us. He'll walk with us. He'll even help us in the moment by moment if we'll just simply listen. You say, Pastor, how, how, do, how do we do that? Listen, here's what I think. I think it is wildly simple, but I think we make it an absolute monstrosity of complication. I think it is as simple as just inside where we think and where we're trying to sort out stuff. If we would just take three or four seconds and say, God, I know you're with me. Help me to know what next step. Show me how to respond. I promise you when you do that, the God who dwells in you, believer, is never going to tell you to dress down that person that has upset you. He's never going to lead us to make a decision that we know deep down in our heart is wrong. If we ask him, he will show us. Here's what I think. I think we don't ask him a lot of time as his followers because we know he'll tell us and we're afraid he's going to tell us what we don't want to hear. How much frustration could we set aside if we just simply made it a practice to talk to him? And then listen for the answer. Not voices in your head. Probably not an audible voice speaking over the radio. We'd love for it to be. Probably not an airplane with smoke trailing, making letters in the sky that we would love to say, oh yeah, I would love, if God would just say what he wants, I could do it. No, he wouldn't. But... If we would ask, I think he would reveal. And when he reveals, we can respond. Followers of Jesus, we can experience that new life today. Reminder number nine. We got over into some challenging things. In chapter number nine, he began to speak about things that challenged our faith. If, if, if the salvation that is provided by God came through the people of Israel... But they didn't believe. In fact, they rejected Jesus. Well, how, how safe is this plan of God's if it didn't even work for his own people? And the apostle backed up and said, well, let's talk about some things so that it may will clear up how we're thinking about what we're seeing. I don't know how much of that it did, but we certainly waded through the next three chapters. Reminder number nine we find in chapter number nine, and that is this. God is sovereign over the salvation that he offers. You say, how does that work? Well, at the end of the day, I have to be honest and say, I don't have a clue. But God is righteous in his sovereignty. So whatever it is that God does as he mitigates his plan of redemption is always going to be right. And we'll never catch God on the hook and go, ah, ah, see there, that's not fair. That'll never happen. And so we have to back up and go, okay, so whatever it means that God knows what he's doing and whatever we're seeing is under the umbrella of God's sovereignty. We don't know how that works. We certainly don't know how that works within the realm of, of the free will that he gives us. But we have to back up and just go, okay, Lord, I just trust you. You're sovereign. You know what you're doing. Romans 9, 14 to 16. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means 
For he says to Moses, he's going back to the Old Testament, he was saying to Moses way back when, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. And it's our job to say, yes, sir. So then, verse 16, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. How does that work? I don't know. But we have to be reminded that God is in control and he does not owe us any explanation. Verse number 18, so then, he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? If the answer to that is yes, you can be thankful not only that God has provided an opportunity for you to embrace Jesus, but you can be thankful that in his sovereignty, he has come to you. And we can be thankful for that. Chapter number 10 gives our 10th reminder that even though God is sovereign over the salvation he offers, it is our responsibility to respond in faith to God's offer of salvation. God's not going to force us beyond our will. Even though we don't know how those two things work together, we still have to receive of our own will the offer that he has provided to each one of us. One of my favorite passages in all of Romans, Romans 10, 9 to 13. It says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. It doesn't matter how much baggage you got. It doesn't matter how much brokenness you carry. It doesn't matter how much you flubbed or failed. It doesn't matter what, what, what amount of mess your life is. Everyone who will confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, believing in their heart, he is who he says he is, and that God raised him from the dead. God will transform you by his grace. He'll justify you. He'll bring you into his family. He'll make you one of his. He'll deposit the Holy Spirit in you. He'll lead you today. He will guide you in his will for now, and then he will transport you to be with him when that time comes. And it's all by his grace, but you got to respond. I got to respond. If he's drawing you to Day and you've never trusted him, today is the day to say yes to him because there's nobody else to say yes to, only to him. He pulls in everyone who believes. There's no distinction between Jew or Greek, Jew, Gentile, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. Look at this. Say it with me. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everybody. Reminder number 11. We find it in chapter number 11, and that is this. Yes, Israel did not respond. But God is saving everyone who calls on his name through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And there is coming a time when God is going to continue or he's going to fulfill promises that he made to his people even though they rejected him over here. God is not finished with Israel as a nation. Chapter number 11, verses 1 and 2. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew, whom he forechose, those that he established a relationship with. He has not rejected them completely. Verse number 12 of Romans 11 Paul says, now if their trespass, which means the riches for the which means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? It's a big ordeal, but Paul says, look, God in his sovereignty used their rejection as an opportunity 
to invite all to come. He expanded the invitation through their rejection. And yes, that was their will, but it's also his plan, and he's inviting us all. And what he's saying is, hey, Gentiles, aren't you glad that there was a window for you to come in? Aren't you glad that God extended that opportunity? And it came on the heels of their rejection. And if that was a glorious thing, that even through his own people saying no, he gave an opportunity for the millions to say yes, how much greater is it going to be when God turns to his people and says, now, are you ready to believe? And they say Yes, Lord, looking on the one that they pierced, looking on the one that they killed, and they go, yes, we do. How much more glorious is that going to be? And here's what Paul says, just sit back, relax. God's got this under his sovereign control, and he's not finished with his people. And it's going to be exciting one of these days to witness. And then he moves into the applicational aspect of the letter. And he says, now knowing these things that we know, here are some things that I want you to do in response. If you are a follower of Jesus by faith, here are some helpful reminders that we can do. Chapter 12, verse number 1 and 2, it tells us that Christians are called to live with a surrendered life and a renewed mind. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifice." Holy and acceptable God, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. He says, now that you are in the family, you've been justified. Now that God's working in you through the Holy Spirit, what you do in response is hand him the keys to your life and say, I want you to drive because you can lead me better than I can. We surrender our life and we allow ourselves to be renewed in our thinking through the Word of God, the Spirit of God and surrounding ourselves with the people of God so that we become different as God intended us to become through his work and our participation by faith and in obedience. Reminder number 13, he says that Christians are called to be obedient to God by submitting to governing authorities. He says in 13, 1 and 2, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there's no authority except from God. God and those that exist have been instituted by God. Listen to that. Those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. Now we say, God, you've made a big old mess, except we can't say that because He is sovereign. He knows exactly what He's doing. Is it possible? That the authorities that exist right now for us are in fact God's intention to judge? It's very possible. Here's what we need to do. We need to sit back and recognize that God's in control and we are not. And he calls us to be obedient to him by submitting to those authorities. That doesn't mean we do everything they say. When they ask us to go against what God's Word clearly teaches, then we have to say no, and we accept the consequences of saying no. But otherwise, we need to submit and to demonstrate our obedience to Him by demonstrating our obedience to them. We'll have more to say about governing authorities next week, so I'll encourage you to be back. Reminder number 14. Christians must not use their freedoms. We've been set free. We're no longer enslaved to sin. We're walking in freedom in Christ. But we can't use our freedoms to judge our brothers and sisters or allow our freedoms to cause others to stumble. Romans uh, chapter number 14, verse number 3. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Verse 13, therefore let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide to never put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of our brother. We've been set free, and how we live out our life before God is between us and our master. 
We need to give one another grace. And when they're participating in things that are clearly not identified as sin, even if that's not what we do, we've got to give folks grace. We don't judge with our freedoms. We don't judge with what we abstain. And we certainly don't want to invite others to participate into things that go against their conscience because that would lead them into stumbling. The great thing that we learn is that we are free in Christ. Not to sin, not to do what we please, but to follow Follow him in obedience as he's called us, and we need to use that as an opportunity to galvanize ourselves with one another, even those who may be different. Reminder number 15 speaks into that pursuit of others. Christians are called to pursue unity, welcoming others as Christ welcomed us, even when we're different. He says, May the God of endurance. And encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. We welcome those that are different. We welcome those who see life differently because Christ has welcomed us and it gives us the opportunity to partner with him in that pursuit of unity. And then our 16th reminder. Christians need to watch out for and avoid false teachers. Verse number 17 and 18 of chapter 16, Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who would cause division and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine of our Lord Christ. But their own appetite. Oh, I'm sorry. And avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. We got to watch out for those that would promote false teaching, false doctrines, those things that are not consistent with the essentials of the faith that have been handed down from Christ through the apostles. A lot of review, 16 chapters, a lot we couldn't identify. But those are the big parts. Those are the big points as we've moved through the letter to the Romans that is all about the gospel. Why we need it, how it comes to us, how we receive it, what we have as a result of it, and then how we put it to practice practically. And now on our way out the door, I want to urge us to take those things that we have seen, those things that we have learned in more detail along the way, and let's use the book, let's use the letter as a way to rejoice. Paul has added in this letter a few that things that are called doxologies, opportunities to praise God for what he has done or what he has promised. Sometimes they were small in response to something he said and it seems to have been maybe spontaneous that he says all praise to the glory of our God and Savior. But there are a couple of passages that are a little longer that give us something to really hang our our rejoicing on. And I want to offer this morning three opportunities. Number one, that we rejoice in Romans 13, 33 through 36. We rejoice in the God from whom, through whom, and to whom are all things. He says, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? And the answer to that is no man. For, t- for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. And everybody said, we rejoice. Secondly, in chapter 16, verse 25 through 27, we rejoice in the only wise God who saves and strengthens us Through the same gospel. Notice Paul says, Now to him who is able to strengthen you, and he is, according to my gospel, not the gospel sourced in Paul, but according to the gospel that he is presenting that's been given to him to share. 
and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages. What is this mystery? That that Messiah is actually going to be God the Son. And that this message is not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. Are you kidding me? This is what God planned from all along, and it's now just being revealed but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith for all who will believe to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Christ Jesus and everyone said we rejoice in the only wise God who saves us and strengthens us through the gospel. I'm going to invite you to stand with me at this time. The praise team is going to come up. They're going to close us in a song, but everybody's going to stand. There are times when the scriptures will have what's called a benediction, a blessing, if you will. And that blessing is extended to those who are hearing, but certainly to all those who will hear. It's a blessing. It's a promise. It is a a message that we can walk out of here in with absolute confidence that what God has said in those ages past is still true for us today. And at the end of chapter 15, it seemed like Paul was done with his letter because he added this little blessing. He added this little blessing benediction. And I want to encourage you to receive this today. This message is, may the God of hope fill you who know Jesus as your Savior, if you do, may the God of hope fill you with all joy. That's joy in Him that is far surpassing all of the things that may cause us frustration right now. May the God of all hope fill you with all joy and fill you with peace in your believing. It's not just about you believing and being saved by grace. It's about believing and having the peace of God. Therefore, those of us who have been justified have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, that he may fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit that resounds and indwells you, you may abound in hope. Not I hope so, not I sure do hope it's going to happen. No, confident insurance that you may abound in the confident assurance of the one who saved you, the one who's sustaining you, the one who's going to bring you to completion regardless of what it looks like around you. May the power of the Holy Spirit make you abound in hope. And a lot of times when we start a sermon, we'll have the scripture read We'll have uh, someone come up and read it, and then they will always end it with these words. This is the word of the Lord. And your response is to be, thanks be to God. That should be your words. Listen, church, we've just skipped the mountaintops of Romans all the way to the end. We've heard what God has had to say. We've seen what God has done and is doing. And we have asked him to fill us with joy and peace and confident assurance through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is indeed the word of the Lord. And we will celebrate that in song. Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the letter to the church in Rome. May it resound within our heart and mind. May its truths continue to to cause us to, to return to you over and over again to your justification, the sanctification, the glorification that is to come. God, may we find our purpose in you every single day with confident assurance that what you've said and who you are is who we can count on. We love you. We thank you. We look forward to everything that is in store. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said?